Today, for our Experts in Emotion interview, we have the honor of speaking with Dr. Kent Barrage on pleasure and reward in the brain. Kent Barrage is the James Old Collegiate Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience in the Department of Psychology at the University of Michigan. Barrage's current research focuses on answering questions such as, how is pleasure generated in the brain? Is happiness in the brain? And how do wanting and liking interact? He also answers questions such as, what causes addiction? Does fear share anything with desire? And can an emotion ever be unconscious? Um, Dr. Barrage serves on editorial boards for several scientific journals, and he's co-edited the book, Pleasures of the Brain. And among many honors, um, Barrage has been a Guggenheim Fellow and a Fulbright Senior Scholar. So I now turn to our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Kent Barrage on pleasure and reward in the human brain. Welcome, Kent. Thanks for speaking with us. Well, thank you, June, for including me in your series. Oh, it's a pleasure. I know that one of the things that many people out there would want to know about you is what first got you started or interested in the study of emotion and pleasure in the first place? Well, I've always thought that emotion, pleasure, and affect are sort of essential qualities of psychological experience, you know, something that we'd love to be able to understand. And there were opportunities to probe it a bit, and it's been fun. Excellent. And so I want to move now just to a few questions about your research, which is very, very exciting, and I, I feel honored to be able to speak with you about it today. So the first question I want to ask you is just a bit about your work that's really, you know, paved the way for understanding distinctions between anticipation or wanting of rewards on the one hand from the consumatory experience or liking of rewards on the other hand. And I wondered if you could elaborate on this really interesting distinction between wanting versus liking. Well, it's a distinction that we sort of stumbled upon. We weren't ever expecting it, but it turns out that the brain seems to make a big distinction between its mechanisms of liking something and its mechanisms of wanting that same thing. We actually started many years ago looking at dopamine, thinking it was going to be a mechanism of liking. There was so much reason to think that dopamine was a pleasure mechanism in the brain that was causing our liking. And in our hands, it seemed not to do that, and that led us to puzzle, how could dopamine look like wanting and look, sorry, look like liking, but yet not be liking? And that led us to the possibility that wanting was something dopamine could do um, that would sort of go along with liking usually. So in what way have the tools of neuroscience that you've used heavily in your work supported this distinction between liking versus wanting? Well, they've helped us these tools to tease apart the brain mechanisms of liking versus wanting. But you know, I would really want to stress that the tools are, are really sort of a, they, they give you an opportunity for an open-ended question. The answer could have been that there was no difference. You know, that dopamine was liking, or that the mechanisms of liking and wanting, whatever they are, are always bound inseparably together. The answer was not that. The answer was that they came apart, and, and that was a product of the tools. But the tools, of course, they just lead you to wherever the truth is, and the truth is out there somewhere to be found. That's a lovely way to think about it, as you know, being a scientist, you're really trying to discover the truth that's already there, and you just sort of stumble upon whatever it's going to tell you. Well, I think it helps to have an open mind as we do these things, you know. I mean, we all get attached to our theories and our hypotheses, and we all get a little bit disappointed when the results turn out not to be what we expected. I, mean, I was disappointed, actually, at first, when dopamine wasn't pleasure-liking really thought that we were going to help confirm that. Um, but often what turns out to be actually true is more interesting in the end than what we thought was true in the beginning. So I think if we start with an open mind, we end up in a good place. Excellent. I mean, in your work, you know, on trying to understand pleasure and reward and teasing apart wanting and liking has not only had these kind of basic science implications, but it's really generated important insights into disorders that involve dysregulated reward functioning, you know, such as addiction, for example, in some of the work you're doing. And I wonder if you could share what you see as some of the most exciting discoveries in this sort of clinical or translational realm of your work. Well, addiction was our first application with my colleague Terry Robinson here at the University of Michigan when we discovered the difference between liking and wanting systems. And the reason for the addiction application was because it was, it's been known almost forever that drugs of abuse not only activate dopamine systems, 
but they can actually permanently change them in some ways, including one way called sensitization that makes those dopamine systems hyper-reactive to drugs in the future and to drug-related cues. And an addict, if a person was undergoing sensitization of their dopamine systems, this could create a form of addiction where they would want rewards even if they didn't like those rewards anymore. And some addicts might fit this sort of characterization. Addiction was the first application, and that was as far as I thought we could ever go. Um, you know, and, and actually a number of years ago, about 10 years ago, another colleague here in social psychology, Robert Zions, suggested to me at the time that wanting versus liking would have wider psychological applications beyond addiction. And I thought, well, Bob, that's interesting, but we only had a mechanism for dopamine sensitization, and I just couldn't go there. But in the last 10 years or so, a number of other people have gone to other applications, from eating disorders to um, things that can happen even in schizophrenia and some other forms of psychological pursuits, sometimes of, of ideas and things that can become very intense. And it may actually be that the distinction between wanting versus liking plays out in a number of clinical conditions. So it might have more general applications. That's something that's kind of exciting that's just beginning to emerge. Well, I was going to say, you know, your work has really been a model for some of the findings that we've been discovering in our lab, applying it to disorders like bipolar disorder, right, that seem to involve dysfunction both in liking and wanting. That's a marvelous application that you're doing, and I think it's really fascinating. Yeah, well, we owe it all to your work here, as do many other, you know, clinical psychology researchers trying to understand the nature of reward dysfunction. Uh, so we have to thank you for those discoveries. Um, but on this note, you know, I wonder sort of how do you think we can apply these models, you know, of dysregulated either liking and or wanting ultimately towards aiding in differential diagnosis or developing really, you know, process-driven, uh, you know, interventions for disorders ranging from addiction to schizophrenia, perhaps even to mood disorders like bipolar disorder or depression. Well, I, I love your emphasis on process-based explanation. I think that's exactly what we want to do. And we don't have a roadmap in the beginning for how it's going to play out, for how the wanting liking distinction will apply to these things or any other process distinction. But I think if we're sensitive to processes and if people like you who are actually looking at the clinical disorders are teasing apart the processes, that's really marvelous. And that's going to give a better signature to what these disorders really are. And at the same time, people like me who are sort of just exploring the basic mechanisms of psychological processes and what the nature of the basic psychological processes are, um, there may be further you know, developments that have implications for the disorders. So I think it's marvelous to kind of meet in the middle. And we don't know where we're going to end up. But by paying a lot of attention to the processes, we will probably end up in a better place. That's a lovely note to think about, and I think many people will take those kernels of wisdom as they try to move forward and develop these models of understanding, you know, basic mechanisms of reward as well as when it goes awry. Um, I wanted to ask you about another area of your research, um, which is investigating how conscious as well as unconscious emotions can be involved in everyday pleasures and desires. I know this is a topic that probably interests a lot of people out there listening to this. So I wondered if you could say a little bit about the neural basis of these conscious and uh, unconscious feelings like pleasure, for example. Well, I wish I could say something reasonable about the neural basis of conscious versus unconscious distinction. Mm -hmm. and I think. That's a major challenge for us all. It's very mm -hmm. hard to do that. But the basic distinction between conscious pleasure and unconscious pleasure, which is still very much up in the air, you know, sort of started with people like Bob Zions, a social psychologist who was interested in sort of immediate unconscious emotional reactions that happened before there was the opportunity for much thinking in people. He started in the 1970s and 1980s advancing that idea. People like John Kilstrom, Marnie Ullman, and the psychological side people like Joe Ledoux and Antonio Damasio on sort of the neuroscience side have been entertaining for many years that the essence of pleasure and displeasure, the essence of emotion might not be conscious. And whether it's conscious or not, that goes way back. Freud had an opinion and he actually wrote that there was no such thing as unconscious emotion. Um, very, very surprisingly since he thought so much else could be unconscious. But the argument's gone back and forth over the ages. There is evidence now, I think, evidence at least, that there might be unconscious emotional reactions. And my colleague, Gilda Winkleman, who's now at UCSD, has 
contributed some of that evidence. I believe that there can be unconscious emotional processes. But the story's still playing out, right? So the evidence is still coming in and we need a lot more evidence. Now on the neuroscience side, you know, in one sense we have a very sensible story for many years that um, prefrontal cortex, so special in humans, might be the basis for our conscious emotion and some subcortical mechanisms of emotion might be sort of the basis of unconscious emotional processes if they exist. And I think that story is plausible. I've said it myself and written it myself with colleagues. But probably in the end, there isn't much evidence for it. And there's actually more and more evidence against that particular distinction that prefrontal cortex is going to be the seat of consciousness and subcortical structures would be, the, would be always unconscious. What the real truth is, that's harder to say, but it's a great topic for anybody interested in brain mechanisms of consciousness, and hopefully in the next years, new psychologists and neuroscientists will find out new things about it. Excellent. I mean, do you think, I know it sounds like this is a really wide open field with a lot of room for discovery. Do we have a sense of what might be the implications? The more we learn about unconscious and conscious pleasure, you know, uh, for decision making, for example, or you know, what kind of implications would these different levels of pleasure have in our everyday behaviors? I think that's such a great question, June, and there's bound to be implications. If there really is a distinction between unconscious emotion and conscious ones, there's bound to be um, applications, implications of that for the basis of decision making. What it's going to turn out to be, of course, that's an open question. But what's marvelous now is that I think the psychology and neuroscience of pleasure is making the great bounds and emotion can make great bounds. Um, my uh, colleague, Morton Kringlebach at Oxford University, has sort of helped lead the way in the last 10 years on sort of a neuroscience of pleasure, developing that and trying to put that on the table in a more formulated way. And the psychology and neuroscience of conscious versus unconscious processes is something which kind of moves and fits and starts, but it's made a lot of progress at moments in the last decade or so. Um, so I think you know, these could come together. There's so much room for more progress um, on both of those topics. So it's really, it's for the future. And for people who watch these videos, um, it's, it's really in their hands. Well, and you mentioned the future and sort of you know, where it may go. And so that leads me to the question I wanted to ask you, which is sort of where do you see kind of the, the face of the future headed in emotion research? Well, I, th I think that emotion research and emotion neuroscience is ripe for a lot more progress. You know, even though emotion and affect, pleasure, displeasure, have been topics in psychology for 100, 100 years, they've been relatively neglected compared to the amount of attention and progress that's been made in cognition and learning and memory and perception, other social interactions, other psychological processes. But progress can be made in emotion and pleasure and affect of neuroscience. So it's something which I think if we're willing to engage the processes, take an open mind, be willing to encounter answers that at this moment we can't even conceive, then people will find really interesting new answers and a lot of progress can be made. It's, it's yet to be cracked open this topic, but it can be. So when you give advice to students who are thinking about maybe toying with the idea of embarking in this mysterious and wide open field of emotion, what kind of advice do you usually give them? Well, I'd say you know, for anybody considering a career in psychology or in neuroscience, you want to follow your deepest interests, you want to find something, a phenomenon, a question that really excites you. If this is the question, the basis of pleasure, the basis of emotion psychologically and in the brain, and the relation of those to conscious versus unconscious processing, if this is the question that really excites you, you just want to go with that and you want to find a phenomenon. I mean, in the end, we need a question and we all need something to study, some sort of aspect of emotion, some, something that's happening. We have to kind of wrap our question around the phenomenon that we can actually approach. So look for phenomena that interests you. And if you find one, jump on it and then just study it, study it, look for the processes involved and you may find something new. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today, Kent. Um, it was terrific hearing your thoughts to these provocative questions about what got you here in the first place, the kinds of projects you've been doing, and where you see the future headed from here. Well, it's been great to talk with you, June, and 
thank you so much and good luck. Thank you. So this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Kent Barrage from the University of Michigan.